Well, good morning, my friends. God bless you, and we welcome you to our Sunday morning service, and we bless the Lord. This, Lord willing, is our final online service only message, because as many of you know, starting next Sunday, glory to God, we will be back in our sanctuary uh, and what a day that will be. Lord willing, what a day that will be. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. And those of you in the United States and around the world that participate, uh, you are also welcome to view online. But what a family reunion it's going to be. Next Sunday morning, we're going to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and exalt him and worship him together in the sanctuary. And I can't wait, just looking forward to it with my whole heart. Well, bless the Lord. I want to share with you this morning, I believe, a very necessary and vital message uh, that we need to hear as Christian people, especially in the day and time in which we live. You know, there's something profound about the words of Jesus Christ when he points specifically to someone or to some particular time frame. It's even more powerful when he points to someone and a time frame together. And when Jesus does that, when he points, and I'm talking about it with his own words, during his earthly ministry, when Jesus points to someone and a specific time frame in history, that is a doubly powerful moment of divine counsel that the Lord wants us to get a hold of. There's a reason. Sometimes he'll point to a place or a time or a person but other times he points to a place, a time, and a person. And we're going to look at that this morning because God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And we're going to hear this that Jesus spoke of when he pointed to a time and a place in history and a person. And that's why I am entitling this message, Men Like Noah. Men like Noah. I'd like to give you some scriptures to get this started. First, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Now I want you to remember that. And let's also bring the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And I'd like to read two verses in Hebrews 11 verses 6 and 7. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Praise God, praise God for the reading of his word. Now, my friends, listen intently to me today. There is nothing more important in this life than to know you are a child of God. My friends, you are meant to know this, to know this. The word of God is brought forth for you and I to know this. You are meant 
to know this, to have an assurance of it, to have absolute certainty about it, because that is where the joy is. It is imperative, my friends, to fruitfulness, effectiveness, to overcome. It's, it's essential to victory that as a Christian people, you know that you are his children. Amen. Listen, you are saved in order to save. You're being saved in order to reach others. You are saved that through you, God may save others. The Christian life is not to be centered on self, but to be used of God. Because if you are uncertain about yourself and God's Word and Holy Spirit operating in your life, you won't be able to help anybody else. Think of it. Can the blind lead the blind? But a blessed assurance will let you live in the joy of the Lord. And that joy will provide all the strength that you will ever need to be used of God, protected by God, led by God, preserved by God, lifted up and surrounded by God in a mighty, mighty way. And this is why that you must recognize and remember that because you believed him and received him, he gave you the right to become the sons of God. You are the children of God. And, and, and we see with this that God is trying to tell us here in the book of Hebrews with this great lineup of people that being used of God in a mighty way is nothing new. That God's people have always lived by faith. All the examples given in Hebrews demonstrates this to us. But the common factor in all these people is that they all lived by faith. They all had certainty of full assurance. They, In other words, they knew by the Spirit of God that they were children of God. God himself gave them all this inner witness that he was with them and that he was pleased with them. You see, the secret of these great men that we read of in, in Hebrews, and we're going to look thoroughly at Noah today, but the secret of all of these great folks that we read of is that they knew exactly who they were in their relationship with God. They knew who they were in their relationship to God and toward God. And that is how they were able to live victoriously in this evil world. And this is exactly what God wants for you and I, to know and then to fully appropriate what we know, to put in action, to live in action, to fully appropriate what we know. He wants us to know, and then he wants us to appropriate what we know. So let's take a look at Noah as he expresses this very thing. Now, Noah knew who he was in God. He had the assurance. He knew who he was and where he stood and where he was going. Listen to this in Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things, divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith." powerful. Now, understanding his life and faith is profoundly important to all of us, especially in the hour in which we live. This, my friends, is why Jesus pointed to this time in history, this place in history, and this man in history. 
That's a trifecta right there, man. I mean, that there it is. Jesus points to a time, a place, and a man. We have to hear what Jesus is saying. Why is he pointing to him? Why did he bring him up? Why did he say, as in the days of Noah, so shall the end times be? Why does he point us to Noah? Because our understanding his life in faith is profoundly important. We must see it. Jesus pointed us to it. Therefore, we must diligently seek it out, especially in the hour in which we live. This verse that we see in Hebrews 11, verse 7, is profound for all of us in the days in which we find ourselves. And in Noah, praise God, and Jesus pointed us there. He wanted us to see this. In Noah, we see a man who walked through all of it, the devastating darkness and wickedness and chaos and evil and deterioration of his day, Noah walked through all of it triumphantly by faith. And listen, my friends, the world today needs men like Noah. The first thing we see about him is that he had and enjoyed this certainty that he knew he was a child of God. I want to read you something in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 6. Genesis 6, beginning at verse 7. And the Lord is speaking here to Noah. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is God speaking of Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Listen to how the Holy Spirit puts this. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, Noah walked with God. Hallelujah. Noah walked with God. I want you to notice that, that Noah walked with God. You know what this tells us? That God walked with him. In Genesis, same chapter 6, listen to this in verse 17. Now God, first we saw God speaking of Noah. Now we see God speaking directly to Noah. Genesis 6, verses 17 and 18. God says, and behold, I myself, God speaking to Noah, and he says, and behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I, but I, God says to Noah, but I will establish my covenant. Now look at this personal, intimate relationship. God says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Glory to God. Do you see this? You see, Noah walked with God. What does that tell us? God walked with Noah. In Genesis, we see God speaking this to Noah. And what is he saying? He's saying, God is saying, Noah, a destruction is coming. Now listen to me, my friends. God pointed us to this time and place and man and testimony for a reason. It's profoundly necessary and prophetic to understand it. God says, Noah, a destruction is coming, but it's not going to apply to you, Noah. You are in a special position. You see, what is that? This is God giving him an assurance. Noah is not walking in the dark in the midst of the wickedness and evil and deterioration and chaos and violence of his day, this en masse global rebellion and sickness. Noah is not walking in the dark. 
He is not living or acting in the dark. He's not in the dark at this moment that God is speaking to him, nor is he or will he be in the dark in the things that are about to come, the coming destruction. Noah is living and acting on the basis of absolute and certain knowledge. God is speaking to him. This is why I, I told you in the beginning of the message that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is what God was doing with Noah. The Spirit of God was bearing witness with Noah's spirit. You're mine, Noah. You are mine. I am with you in the midst of this wickedness and darkness. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Those of you that have received and believed him, he has given you the right to become the sons of God. Noah had this assurance, and it was God who gave it to him. You were meant to know this. You too were meant to have this. This is why I say, this is the kind of man the world needs. And this is the kind of man and person man or woman, we all ought to be. This is the kind of man the world needs. Peter said, seeing these things are coming upon the earth, what manner of persons ought we to be? Hear that. The Spirit of God speaking through Peter, seeing these things are coming upon the earth, what manner of persons ought we to be? Now think of it, my friends, with our world being the way it is, how many are like this man, Noah? That is what we have to look at, and that's why Jesus pointed him out, told us, look at him, look at his generation, because just as in his life and just as in his generation, he was pointing to the condition of the generation, but what stood in stark and bright, illuminating contrast to that was the life and testimony of a man called Noah. And this is why we have to look at it. Jesus pointed us to it. We have to look at this in the midst of all the hell raging all around Noah. He lived a life of joy, peace, assurance, and blessing. Whoa, now what was his secret? Well, let's take a further look. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6 and take a look at verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. And he goes on to say, this is the Holy Spirit. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. We're trying to discover the secret of Noah. What was the secret? Why was he such a man that in the midst of the most evil, wicked generation in history, Jesus points to him and that generation and his witness in it? Well, first of all, we see the Holy Spirit begins to give us some clues into the secret. Noah was a just man, a righteous man, perfect, meaning blameless in his generation. Now hear this, Noah being just or righteous simply tells us, it simply tells us that he was deeply concerned about the righteousness of God. The very character and heart of God, Noah sought, desired with all of his heart. He cared about God. He thought about God. He walked with God. His heart was upon the Lord. Can I say that again? This is one of the profound reasons Jesus pointed to him. He cared about God. He thought about God. He walked with God. His heart was upon the Lord. He was deeply and daily concerned about the righteousness of God. You know what? This is all faith. This is all faith. Now, this doesn't mean that Noah was always perfect in his conduct 
or perfect in his behavior, a just and righteous man evidenced in the Bible are those men whose concerns and thoughts and desires are always God. They are always thinking, seeking, and desiring the things of God. You see, that's how the Bible defines to us what a just and righteous man is. They're not always perfect in conduct or perfect in behavior, but just and righteous men are those men whose concerns and thoughts and desires are always upon God and the things of God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, Noah always sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In his life, Noah did this. In his thoughts, that is why God calls him just. That is why God calls him righteous. Then we see the word perfect, that he was perfect in his generations or blameless. Now, this doesn't mean he was sinless. He was blameless, but it doesn't mean he was sinless. There has never been anyone in the world sinless since the fall of Adam, except for one, our Lord Jesus himself. Noah wasn't perfect in the sense that there was a complete absence of sin. There's no such thing. It really significantly yet simply means that he was daily, deeply, and genuinely seeking God, always first in his life. He sought God and his righteousness first. He was walking with God, fully and completely sincere. He was a genuine man. There was no double-mindedness in him. He was genuine before God and genuine as unto the Lord. You ready? He was a man who desired no mixture with this world. He lived exclusively as unto the Lord. He found and built his life in God. This is where he was, and this is where he stayed. And he desired wholeheartedly the presence of God and the things of God. And he was all of this, all of this amongst the people that surrounded him in his generation. He was all of this amidst the turmoil and wickedness and chaos and violence and, and, and perversion and sinfulness of his generation. He was all of this that I explained to you, that the Holy Spirit explained to us in the midst of all of that. Of all of what? Well, the scripture says concerning this, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that all the thoughts of men were only evil and corrupt continually. Think of this generation and think of what's emerging in the hour and day in which we live. This became full blossom. We're, we're now blossoming for sure. This is full blossom. And this is why God tells us, look at Noah, look at his time, look at his testimony, look at his generation, look at that activity. What does God say of that? God saw the wickedness of men was great in the earth and that all the thoughts of men were only evil and corrupt continually. There was no breather. From the rising of the sun, all through the going down of the sun, all through the night, nothing but evil and corruption continually. The entire generation was given to sin, violence, wickedness, perversion, and all the horror that comes from it. They all departed from God, guilty of violence and the most brutal and horrific practices of sin. There were violent giants, abominations everywhere, violence and perversions everywhere. 
But we are told that in the midst of all of this, Noah was just, perfect, righteous, blameless in the midst of all of that. He didn't belong to any of them. He stood out in the midst of all of it. Now that shows us his character. And this is why the Holy Spirit tells us, and Noah walked with God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, Noah walked with God. What a testimony. His, his one great desire, his greatest ambition in life was to walk with the Lord. Noah truly was a man of God. What manner of persons ought we to be seeing that these things are coming upon the earth? You see, Noah's heart desired to know that God was pleased with him. He lived in faith in order to please God. He lived unto that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Noah lived unto that. He had a daily desire to obey God and carry out his commands. Now, what does this show us? Well, here's another clue. This all shows us, his, we're trying to find out what's the secret of Noah. This all shows us his separation from the world in which he lived. Yes, he was alive in the midst of all of this. All of this darkness and violence and chaos surrounded him. All of the wickedness of the people surrounded him and were pressing ever closer daily in upon him. But he was separate from all of it in thought. He was separate from it all in word. And he was separate from it all in the very actions of his life. Now, think of this. For a time, there were the godly in the earth. For a time, there were the godly in the earth, the descendants of Abel. And there were also the ungodly, the descendants of Cain. And there was a clear distinction. But now, all the lines have been blurred. All of them. Think of the day in which we live, what, what's emerging in great exceeding continuation every day, more and more. You can't turn a blind eye to it. It's evident and obvious. Same thing back then. There was a clear distinction at one time between the godly and the ungodly, but now all the lines have been blurred. Slowly but surely, the godly of Noah's generation, the godly, begin to embrace the practices and lifestyles of the ungodly. Even fallen angels who entered into human women were bringing about monstrous offspring. And there they are, these hybrids, this combination of wicked demons entering into the daughters of men, bringing about this monstrous offspring. And this is the entire story throughout the Bible, right up until the last days. What is it? This demonic mixture. There was a time of distinction between the godly and the ungodly. But when the enemy begins to turn up the heat, all of a sudden the lines get blurred and the godly begin to embrace the practices and lifestyles of the ungodly. What is it? This compromise this desire for the world that not only blur, blurs the lines, but ultimately leads to blindness. It blinds these individuals. It's the blind leading the blind. Even the godly line. Hear this, my friends. This is why Jesus pointed to this. He knew what we would find and see. And we're living in a generation where we got to unpack these truths more than anyone else in history. Jesus knew what we would see when he pointed to Noah and his generation and his testimony, this place in, 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 in humanity. Even the godly line of people had gone astray. And here they are. Even them are now part, they're part of the saturated evil and wickedness of an entire generation. And it's because of all of that that God comes to this decision to flood 
the earth. But here we see that this man Noah was not like any of that or any of them. This man held firm. He held to the truth. He carried a true witness. He wasn't governed by the mind and outlook of this world. And he didn't conform to it. Praise God. He wasn't overwhelmed by the headlines. Got to write that down. He wasn't overwhelmed by the headlines, nor was he governed by them. And Noah was not seduced into a fear or depression or anxiety because of them, because of the condition of all of society all around him. Now we see more and more why Jesus pointed to him. God said, this is my son, hear him. Take God's advice, hear the words of Jesus. Jesus points to Noah. Why? He knows what we'll find when we get there. Now think of it. Today we're living in an age which has and continues to manifest the actions and attitudes of Noah's generation before the flood. You see it for yourself. Today, people question whether or not there even is such a thing as decency or order or lawfulness or morality or absolutes of any kind. Even more tragically, people, and this is heartbreaking but true, people in known personalities within the Christian church are not only of this mindset, but they're even beginning to question the very heart and word of God. People and known personalities in the Christian church, many of them totally diluting and, and distorting God's word, bringing new doctrines to justify sin and compromise at every conceivable level, this is how it began in Noah's generation before the full blossom that led to the flood. In our day, same thing. Many even endorsing, even in the realm of Christianity, ordaining the very perversions that led to the very wrath and judgment of Almighty God. I mean, here it is. Here it all is again. Here it all is again, just as in the days of Noah. Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior and King, said that and pointed to this time frame and this man for a reason. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, one more time. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, this is becoming our world. This is our daily headlines. People everywhere rejoicing in evil, even luring the children into it. Here we are again, right back to the pre-flood reality. But Jesus pointed to Noah. Why? Because Noah stood out. He didn't conform to it, and he wasn't influenced by it. He was a man apart from it all. He refused to entertain it. Noah refused to let it in. And because he walked with God, he did not look for or make up a doctrine that would justify it. Praise God. Nor did he lend an ear to any of the former godly of the generation who have now deteriorated, who brought doctrines to justify the evil, the wickedness, the sinful condition of his generation. Noah didn't conform to that. He didn't look for a doctrine to do that. He didn't make up one, nor did he lend his ear to one. He stood out. He didn't live to the flesh. He didn't live to fit in to his generation. He didn't live to impress the people or to be accepted by them. He wasn't governed by the world, the flesh, 
or the devil. No, no, no. Noah was a man of godly integrity, a man of God. Even though he was surrounded by evil continually, Noah walked with God. What manner of persons ought we to be seeing that these same things and worse are coming upon us? Let's look again at Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 7. Let's look again at that. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You see that wording? He condemned the world then. And his testimony again condemns our generation today. Oh God, give us ears to hear this word. If we have ears to hear this condemnation, how Noah's obedience and testimony condemned the world, this word then becomes a godly warning and blessing to all of us. But we have to hear it. This is why Jesus pointed to it. What made Noah, Noah? Well, the answer is his faith. He believed God. That's it. That's faith. Believing God, resting upon everything that God has said, and resting everything upon what God has said. He believed God. And all that he said, whether he saw it yet or not, he believed it. What, what made Noah Noah? The answer is his faith. That's the secret of Noah. That's the secret of all these men we read of, these great men of faith. That is what made Noah the man he was. He was the man he ought to be. What manner of persons ought we to be? Noah was the man he ought to be. When? in the midst of his generation, where? In the midst of his generation, in the darkness and evil and chaos and perversion and violence that surrounded him. He was the man he was because he simply believed what God had said. He simply believed what God had revealed. God spoke to him, he believed it. And he lived and acted according to what he believed. Now, my friends, you and I are given the revelation of God's word. You and I. we, The Spirit of God bears witness with us that we are the children of God. We who have believed and received, he's given us the right to be the sons of God, led by the Spirit of God. You and I, you and I are given the revelation of God's word. We see his heart and his position on these things. We see God's word, his heart, his position on all things. And here we see in Noah, a man who believed it. No wonder Jesus points to him. Noah didn't live carelessly or irreverently. He refused to mix or pollute his heart or dilute at any measure his heart with the thoughts and actions of his generation. He lived his life based upon the revelation that God had given him. In other words, he lived his whole life according to the word of God. He believed everything God said and lived according to it. So then, how does it work itself out? Isn't that the question? How does it work itself out? Well, first of all, Let's keep looking at Noah. He believed the warning of the coming destruction. He was not a scoffer. He believed in the warning of the coming destruction. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, 
moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And this is the message to every one of us today. That's the message to every one of us. I want to ask you some questions that we should always ask ourselves. Are you being influenced by the things of this life? Its attitudes, its point of view and points of view, this world's ideologies. Is your desire to be accepted by the world around you? Or do you seek to coattail the latest cause or that which the world applauds in order to be socially acceptable or to be accepted socially? We need to ask ourselves these questions. Are you influenced by voices in and out of the church that question everything, irreverently questioning, diluting, carving up, for self-indulgence and sinful lifestyles, the very word and will and heart of God? Are you influenced by those voices in or out of the church? Are you seeking those doctrines that justify these lifestyles of sin? Because look what it leads to. It's in Noah's day, it fully blossomed. It led to destruction. In our day, it's ever increasingly blossoming, more than at any other time in history since the pre-flood reality. Are you seeking doctrines and voices in and out of the church that justify that kind of lifestyle just to accommodate flesh and make life a little more comfortable for you? That's not what we see in Noah. Are you influenced by those voices and doctrines? If so, if you are, you are very unlike Noah. It's as simple as that. If you are, you are very unlike Noah, nor do you really believe in God? Because believing God is believing what he said. Believing God is believing what he said. Everything that he has said. Everything. Believing God is believing everything that he has said. Noah believed. Noah believed God created this world. And that he belonged to God in this world. Capture that, my dear friends. Noah believed God created the world and that he belonged to God in this world. Noah believed God had the right to do whatever he saw fit to do with the world. Noah believed that. God, you have the right to do whatever you see fit to do with this world. God, you have the right to do whatever you see fit to do with my life and my family. Noah believed that Man was responsible to God. Noah believed that man was accountable to God. Yes, in the midst of a generation that all of the thoughts of men were evil and corrupt and violent and wicked continually. Pre-flood attitude, mentality, lifestyle. Noah still believed in that. That man was still accountable and responsible to God. And also Noah believed all of this and held firm to it in spite of the scoffers of this world. He knew that because of the evil in this world, it could not go on forever. I want you to hear that. Jesus points to Noah for a reason. One of the things Noah knew is that because of the evil in the world in which he lived, it could not go on forever. My friends, please take the time and listen to this in 2 Peter chapter 3. Please take the time and listen to this. This is the day the Lord has made, right? Let's listen to what God has said. He said, Beloved, Peter said this in, in his second epistle, chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds, by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days 
walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world then that existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition and ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and the thousand years is as one day. The Lord not slack, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can you imagine the scoffers against Noah? And I want you to line that up with what we hear today and how they're now wanting to tear down in mass proportion God, all that is God, all that pertains to God. Can you imagine the scoffers against Noah? There he is building the ark 120 years. Can you imagine their voices? Hey, Noah, where is this flood? Where is this coming judgment? You've been saying it for years and nothing happens. Hey, Noah, loosen up a little bit, man. You're a little too strict. You're a little too uptight. You know what, Noah? You're kind of judgmental. Why don't you loosen up and live a little? Why not live a little, Noah? I mean, look at those guys. They were once among who you see as godly. Look at them. They, 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 they still live the way they live, right? The, the, those guys used to hang out with you. But look, they're enjoying life, right? Check it out. This is exactly the attitude today. Not just from the world. But so sadly, even among so many within the church, this is one of the major things God's been trying to deal with these last several months concerning the heart and attitude of the church, not only in America, but around the world, which is why these things are touching the world. Everything God does in the earth, he does according to that which he's doing as unto the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and keeping his covenant with Israel and with the church. Everything, everything he does, everything he decrees, everything he allows, it all speaks to us. And we have to hear it. This is why God pointed to Noah. This is exactly that scoffing, anti-God attitude today. And it's not just in the world, but sadly, even among so many in the church, in exceeding measure, the once godly, the once godly have allowed and embraced mixture and compromise to the point where they're not only among the wicked of the generation, but now they are also the scoffers. Now, my friends, listen, this is not negative criticism. I'm not negative. This is not negative criticism. This is actual sad, heartbreaking fact. Anybody who loves God and his people grieve over this. They grieve over this. These are people, this is just fact, they deny God. They turn away from God. They say you can compromise as much as you want. You can even reject so much of God's word and still be blessed. Then what do you see? From pastors to worship leaders and beyond, they put out headlines and, and social media posts and Facebook posts or whatever it is that they no longer believe in God. I have to let everybody know I no longer believe in God. Right? It's the, the, that they were once considered godly. Now they're among the ungodly. You're seeing it in your own generation. And sadly, many Christians who put their faith in these folks have been terribly and deceitfully impacted by these things and deceitfully influenced, even to the point 
of beginning to question their own faith and commitment to the Word of God. It has an impact. It has an effect unless you're walking with God like Noah did. Why didn't that generation press in and overtake him even though it pressed him daily upon him? Because of what God says of him. This is what we've been looking at all morning long. That's why Jesus pointed to him. But in the midst of all the godly turning away, the deceitfulness, the, the, the violence, the chaos, all of the hatred and all of it, Noah remained steadfast, unmovable, absolutely resolute in his faith. That's why Jesus points to him. We have to hear it. All these people in Noah's generation, you can hear their voices. Where is God? Where is he anyway? But no one knew what God said. Although it had not yet been revealed, this coming destruction, but no one knew that the word of the Lord would surely come to pass. Noah may not have understood all the ways of God. He couldn't even tell them why God was delaying. Men of God today can't tell you why God is delaying other than what we see in the word of God, that his long suffering toward us is that he's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We don't understand this long suffering of God in fullness. We can't tell people fully why God is delaying other than what's been revealed. But one thing Noah knew, God was God seated upon the throne of heaven, and his word and judgments would surely come to pass. That although there's a time of delay, that judgment's going to fall. Jesus points to this and says, just like that is the way it's going to be when this time comes. And you and I are living in this ever-increasing, ever-blossoming reality. And thank God Noah believed it and obeyed God. God. What did he do? He prepared an ark for him and his family. And my friends, if we're going to be like Noah, we have to believe and do the same thing. If we're going to be like, what manner of persons ought we to be? If we're going to be like Noah, that's why Jesus points to him. We have to believe and do the same thing. So I'll end with this. Are you carried away by every wind of doctrine? that ridicules the word of God and ridicules and questions the judgment of God? If so, you'll be carried away by something infinitely more tragic. Are you carried away by every new slogan or movement or crisis or social catchphrase flowing out of the world's experiences and mentality today? Are you carried away by all that stuff? Because if so, you'll be carried away by something infinitely more tragic. But you see, my friends, this is not what God wants for you. That's good news. This is not what God wants for you. For you, the sons of God, the children of God, his spirit bears witness with us that we are the children of God for you. Same way God talked to Noah, you, Noah, you, your family, your wife, your sons, you, for you, if you will hear his voice, if you will receive him and believe him and hold fast in the midst of it, even the apostasy, the turning away, all these former godly, if they were even born again to begin with, I believe some of them may have been, but in all of their turning away and claiming now to be atheists and questioning God and his word, if you will hold fast and if you will maintain an allegiance to God and his word, his spirit will bear witness with your spirit. Praise God that you are the sons of God, the children of God, the people of God. Hallelujah. You will be among the company of Noah. You will be among the company of the great heroes of our faith. You will be among them. Hebrews eleven seven tells us that Noah moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. My friends, I pray you have a right and proper fear of the Lord. 
What did the psalmist tell us? That the problem of the world was. The psalmist said the problem with the world was that there was no fear of God before their eyes. This is what it is. This is the problem. There's no fear of God before their eyes. True Christianity is walking in the fear of the Lord. Is that a terrible thing? It's a beautiful thing. That's what leads God to come to men like Noah and say, you, Noah, you, your wife, your family, your sons, your sons' wives, you, Noah. See, the fear of the Lord leads you to that. The world, the devil, and compromising ministries in the church and ministers in the church, they, they, they scoff at the fear. Oh, it's too strict, too heavy, too judgmental. You know why? Because they're out of balance. They're out of order. They've never really fully been willing to do the work and see what it is God said pertaining to his righteousness. Fear of the Lord is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. Why? Because it leads to God coming to you in the midst of these things coming upon the earth. And he says, you, you walk with me. You've walked with me. Therefore, I walk with you. I'm bringing this upon the earth, but you, your family, your children, your children's children, you're going to be all right. You're, there's an ark of safety that I've prepared for you. That's why Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. That's a lost truth. But we're not going to lose that truth. Not in our ministry. As for us in our house, we will serve the Lord. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. You see, men like Noah, Paul, and Peter, they knew, they knew the God of love was also, first and foremost, a God of righteousness. And because of that righteousness, even though he loves his people, he's also a God of wrath and judgment. And those that are outside of covenant, those that are not in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, are going to face it. And this is why we, knowing the terror of the Lord, persuade men. And because God said it is coming, that these things were surely coming upon the earth, men like Noah, Peter, and Paul, they knew it would come to pass. Why? Because God said it. That's faith. That's the full assurance. God said it, it's going to happen. Irregardless of delay, it's going to happen. And God knows that moment. And what we're seeing in the earth today is so ever-increasing in prophetic measure, I would not take the next minute and not value with eternal reverence that which God is saying to us. Peter, Noah, Paul, men like that, they believed what God said. They believed it. Why? Because the just, Noah was called just, the just shall live by faith. Do it God's way, my friends. Do it God's way. Prepare an ark of safety by believing and receiving Jesus Christ, his son. Prepare this ark of safety and believe in Jesus Christ. Noah didn't argue with God. The ark was God's way of salvation. So those of you listening, don't argue with God. Today, in this generation, especially, because then it was water. What's coming is fire. The ark to salvation today is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do it God's way. Hide yourself in Christ, the ark of God, and be saved from the wrath and judgment to come. And finally, Please remember one last thing about Noah. The Bible tells us he preached this to others. We must warn others to flee from the wrath to come. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you, Lord willing, tomorrow morning on our Facebook devotional at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then again Wednesday night. And we're all looking forward to next Sunday morning where we meet back together at our church with great celebration and some great surprises. Hallelujah.
we send you all of our love. Sister Wanda and I send you all of our love and our prayers. Love one another. It's the right thing to do. What manner of persons ought we to be in the midst of everything we see? Jesus pointed to Noah. Learn of him. God bless you, my friends.